Hello, my name is Espen Anderson. I uh, teach at BI Norwegian Business School, Strategy, Technology and Machine Learning. I teach some of the same topics at the University of Oslo, Department of Computer Science. And uh, I have been a researcher, a consultant and a speaker for most of my fairly long career. And uh, what I'm going to talk about now is how to do a research interview. Um, we tend to do a lot of interviews as part of student papers or thesis, academic projects or consulting projects. And um, I have uh, done, I think, more than a thousand interviews of executives in many countries over the years, and I've developed a method for doing them. So I thought I would share that, partly because I haven't found any other um, sort of guide to how to do interviews um, in an effective and informative way. Now, be aware that um, what I've been doing mostly is interviewing fairly senior executives about topics like technology and business and strategy and how things work. Um, and this way of doing interviews, I think, work, works well. If you're doing things that are more about how people feel, um, more veering towards psychology, or perhaps if you're doing something that just requires you to get um, more numbers or to fill out a questionnaire, you might want to do them slightly differently. But um, this, is, this is the way I do them. And I'll get into the details, but uh, the main point of doing an interview for, for me is to think of it as an informed conversation with somebody you have respect for, who is knowledgeable about what they're talking about, and you are trying to pick their brains on, um, you know, figuring out how something works, whether, you know, a company should do this or that, um, you know, sort of how, how do they do things in their company, trying to get data. Uh, but remember to treat the other person as somebody who is your equal uh, in, in both directions. And the way I like to think of these things is that the interview should, be, should not be seen as a burden on the other person. Um, it should be an interesting conversation and we should both learn something from it. All right, let's get started. Let's get into the practicals. The practicals begin uh, before the interview has begun. You have to do a lot of preparation. Um, one of the first thing you need to do is to book the interview. And um, booking interviews with busy executives can be quite trying, especially um, in countries where um, there is a high degree of hierarchy. You have to go through secretaries and things like that. So um, when you say you're going to do interviews within a certain time frame, for instance, a two week time frame, you should probably start scheduling at least two weeks in advance. So set aside enough time, otherwise you'll be very delayed towards the end. Secondly, I don't think you should do more than three interviews per day. Um, you having an interview, a deep conversation with somebody is quite trying mentally. Um, and you need, and that's another point, schedule one hour for the interview and one hour for writing up the interview notes afterwards. So every interview will take a two hour slot. I find it tiring to do more than two a day. Um, I do three um, occasionally, um, never more than that, simply because I get too tired. I start forgetting what people said. I start forgetting if, whether I asked this question in this interview or not. So I think a maximum of three interviews per day. Um, then you have to ask yourself, am I going to do this interview in person, face to face? Um, am I going to do it over video conference or am I going to do it um, over uh, a telephone? And uh, it depends on what you're looking for. My personal preference, uh, at least if I'm interviewing a number of people for a project, is to do them over the telephone. And that's simply because then I can be a very efficient note-taking machine while I have people on the telephone. Um, I use a headset of some sort um, when I am um, in, in uh, doing the interview. Um, and um, then I can type away on my keyboard or take notes on paper um, and be very efficient about it. I think you should only do face-to-face -face or video interviews if they actually add something. Um, if you want to study facial expressions or something like that, 
and that's not really my case but you know or if you maybe you want to see where people are in an organization or they're going to show you some production facilities then it's more like a company visit than actually doing an interview um, the other one is if you if you need to have a shared space where you can for instance make some drawings or show some diagrams and discuss them then a video conference is much much better but generally i prefer to have just the voice of the person in the other room in on, on the other end a second question you need to think about is um, should you record or not um, you know, you can ask permission of people, of course, to record um, uh, what they're saying. Um, I prefer not to, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, when I did my um, doctoral thesis, I recorded a lot of interviews and I spent a really long time typing them up. And I found that this yielded lots and lots of papers of not very informative material. So I don't think, I, I prefer not to record. The other reason for using a recording is that, you know, you can use it just for support. So you record what they're saying, um, you take notes, you write out your notes, and then if there's something you miss or you want a quote just right, um, then you can go to the tape to, or the, well, not tape these days, but, you know, to the recording and, and, um, and use that. Um, in general, I don't like that much either because recording some will spook some people. Some people don't like to be recorded. Most of them who say, you know, yeah, okay, and then they forget that they're being recorded after a while, so that's not a problem. But in general, I have found that these recordings are just an extra bother. Um, if you're looking for a sharp quote, write it up, send it to people, and say, I think I heard you say this. Is this correct? Okay. Um, so, so you, you, you know, you can interact with people even after you interview them. So, and we'll get to that. So, in general, I don't like to do recording, but I realize if you are not that stiff in English, if you are not very experienced as an interviewer, um, you may want to rely on a recording. Always ask permission though. Then you need to get the technology right. Um, when you are on the phone uh, speaking to somebody, good sound is essential and you also need to have your hands free to take notes. Um, so a good headset is uh, important and uh, you, you may actually want to spend some money here. Um, here is one version which is used by telemarketers. Um, you can use AirPods, uh, those little things you stick in your ear. Uh, my personal preference is actually um, a headset like, like this one. Um, because it shuts out the sound from outside, it's noise cancelling, um, and the sound is very good, and the battery life is good. They're expensive, but I think they're absolutely worth it. So sound is extremely important. Then you have to make an, a decision on how you're going to, to, make, to take the notes. Uh, are you going to do them with handwriting, or are you going to do them um, on a keyboard? And that's a personal preference, but in general, I think if you're doing a face-to-face -face interview, it's better to do handwritten notes because it, it looks less threatening when you're sitting across from a person if you just write um, um, when you take down your notes. Um, when I'm on the telephone or in video conferences, I will use um, a keyboard. Um, I do touch type however and I write quite fast if you don't do that and you have to look at the keyboard all the time you should probably go with handwriting as well but that's up to you so both are, are permissible um, now very very important you should get a good keyboard and it should be a quiet one um, I use a Mac and I use a, a Mac keyboard that looks like this uh, and it's 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 very very quiet you don't hear much um, you might hear a little bit on uh, depends on how insulated your microphone is but having a headset like this helps whatever you do uh, don't get a keyboard that has a lot of black the black noises like this one uh, because uh, that will just be extremely um, disruptive to the whole interview so make sure you got the technology right also, you need to uh, make sure you have no disturbances. So turn your cell phone uh, to um, be quiet and put it on something soft. So if it starts vibrating, um, you, it doesn't reverb through the room. So these are things you just 
need to get um, in there. Also, if you're sitting in an office, put a sign on the door saying, do not disturb. When you get into the flow in an interview, you don't want to be um, interrupted. Also, you need to decide, are you going to do the interview as one person talking to another, or are you going to be more than one person? Um, if you are, you have to be very explicit up front about what the roles are for the people interviewing. And in general, if you're two people, uh, you should divide it up so that one person is the primary note taker and the other one is the primary speaker. Uh, the one, so because it's easier for a, an interview person, an interviewee, to to talk to one person. Um, and I think of yourself a little bit like commentators at a sports game. There's one person talking, and then there's another one that's kind of assisting. It's called a color commentator, um, and uh, but also taking notes. So for by all means, both people doing the interview, or even if, if you're three, everybody should take notes. Uh, but naturally, the person speaking will not take as many notes as the person who's just sitting there. Think about that beforehand. Um, and then you need, before the interview starts, of course, you need to have an interview guide. Um, and that's almost a topic in itself. Um, but I think it's very important that an interview guide is to support a conversation. So it should feel like you're having a conversation. Don't create an interview guide that looks like a questionnaire. Um, that's at least for the type of interviews I do. Um, I don't think that's helpful. I, I, my interview guides tend to be just bullet points of what topics I want covered. No particular order. Um, and I just, you know, mentally tick off as the person answers questions about whatever the topic is. I mentally tick off, yeah, that was point number three, that was point number four. Yeah, we, got, we covered most of this. So you can also send out the interview guide uh, to the person at the other end um, beforehand um, if, you, if you feel like that. Okay, so those are the things you need to do before the interview starts. Now we're well prepared and we're ready to start doing the interview. So now we're ready to start the interview. We're calling the other person and we get him on the line. We get him on a video conference or we're showing up in their workspace, their office, and we're ready to start. Um, you should always bracket interviews with an introduction. There's a middle section, there's an ending. You need to think cautiously about that, consciously about that. So um, I normally start by saying, unless I know these people very well, I'll say, well, my name is such and such. Um, I am doing this as part of a research project for um, this company or this um, institution. Um, and uh, what we're looking for here is to get your views and experiences on this topic. Um, and then I always say, not in a formulaic way, never read this from you know a fixed sentence. Do it conversationally. I say something like, by the way, um, I guess this goes without saying, but just so I said it, everything you say in this interview is confidential. We'll take notes. We'll send you the notes. I'll get back to how we do that. Um, and uh, we will not share anything you say uh, in an identifiable form with anyone unless we get your explicit um, confirmation or permission. And I find it's, it's, it's okay to say it just like that. Don't read sort of a statement and then say, are you okay with this? Um, in general, don't read things out, do them as conversations um, and in natural language. And, and uh, you know, and then most people say, yeah, that's fine. You know, no problem. Um, then when you start the interview itself, um, it's always, you know, you should always start with an easy question um, and to sort of establish the context. So I tend to start with saying just to begin with, can you, you know, just can you tell me a little bit about yourself and, and what you do? Um, and most people can do that easily enough. And then you start uh, talking to them and you you sort of run a conversation, ask polite questions. If they're saying something interesting, you explore it more. Um, one of the things I try to do early is to establish common ground. Um, 
and establishing common ground with a person is 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 easier if you're older like me and you have a lot of experience because then you can always find something that you can relate to um, but you know if they mention for instance um, well I, I started to you know program uh, mainframe computers which are old big computers so then I can say oh yeah yeah I started with that too um, you know those things were quite beasts to program weren't they you know and then you sort of establish that you know you're you're kind of like them. So you establish common ground. Um, I tend to interview a lot of people that are in technical jobs and, and just showing that you know a little bit about technology doesn't need to be much. Um, we'll tell them that this is a person that has some of the same basis of experience as, 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 as I have, as, as they have, um, and they'll trust you more and be much uh, less guarded in what they're saying um, and, and enjoy the experience more. Um, one of the most important things when you do an interview is to listen to what the other person says and respond to that. You know, you may have a list of stuff you want to go through, but the art of the interview is to go through that without showing that you actually have a list to go through. Um, it requires being, you know, somewhat careful about what you say. Sometimes people wander off topic and you just let them speak for a little bit and says, um, back to this issue of, you know, and then you start, you, you sort of steer them back again. Sometimes people have difficulties in understanding what, or, or expressing things in a sort of formal statement. And one of the things I find very helpful if they have trouble doing something is just say, um, can you give me an example of that just so I understand it? Um, and then they will tell you a story or give you an example of something specific. Like, yeah, we had this one customer who was doing this and that. And I said, oh, okay, yeah, I see. Okay, so you, you, you kind of probe for examples and, and explanations of things. By the way, if they use a term you don't understand, uh, they say, you know, some sort of internal term, like, I don't know, DevOps, for instance, or... Uh, some specific financial management term, um, you know, ask right away. Oh, I'm sorry, I, what was the term you were using? Uh, oh, really? Okay, uh, can you, what, what does that mean? Um, and then, you know, that's, that's okay as long as you ask right away. Whatever you do, don't sort of pretend that you know something and then you let them talk on for a long time and then you ask your next question revealing that you had no idea what they're talking about and then the whole situation can get rather awkward so so if you don't understand something uh, just ask and by the way that situation is much easier for a student um, because um, as a student you're allowed not to know as you get older and more senior you're kind of supposed to know and uh, and you have to be more careful um, keep time you are actually asking for people's time uh, and there are two ways of, of making that less of a burden one thing is to keep the um, uh, keep the conversation pleasant um, let them teach you something try to teach them something in return and then you know they'll look at the conversation afterwards and say that was rather pleasant i learned something you know you know um, and um, but but keep time um, sometimes you can do that by having a, a watch um, on your computer screen or, or something and sort of know when there are five minutes left and you should sort of wrap things up um, and um, wrapping, wrapping things up, um, I tend to use a fairly formulaic way of doing that. Um, but um, it depends on the interview, what the topic is, and so on and so forth. But I, I, I'm all, almost always, I ask a question about five minutes away from the end. I say, well, we're kind of concluding this now. Um, one thing I wonder, is there something that I should have asked you? And you're kind of wondering, why didn't he ask that? And then um, this, this is a great way of revealing what people's expectations of the interview are. And, uh, and, uh, and also sometimes you will find things that, that, that you've actually forgotten to ask about and, and they'll, they will want to tell you. I also sometimes, and it depends a bit on the person, the sort of, you know, how comfortable you are with it, but I, and I'm an older person, so maybe I can ask that. But I, I sometimes ask, you know, executives, what keeps you awake at night? Um, and, uh, you know, what do you worry about um, in this context? Um, and sometimes you get very, very interesting answers back. So, you know, every interview is kind of a fishing expedition. You want questions or answers to fairly 
standard things. But you know, it never hurts if you're looking for interesting things going on in companies to, to ask some broader questions, especially towards the end. When you finish the interview, you thank them for their time. And you say, I've been taking notes now. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll write up a summary of this interview and send it to you. So you, you sort of see what I got uh, from it. Um, and um, and um, then, you know, if there's you see something is missing um, and where I misunderstood something, um, then um, please contact me. Um, sometimes an interview can, you know, you, you get so um, enamored or you have a really interesting conversation, you might want to come back and talk to them later. I have had experiences where, you know, a half hour interview turned out to be, you know, with somebody who was very busy and didn't really have time, turn into a three hour marathon conversation about a very, very useful material. So, you know, that you have to be a bit flexible here, but at least, you know, be conscious of their time. Another thing you might do if you see that it stretches over time is um, if you have about five minutes left, um, say this is a really interesting conversation. I, we might need to spend more time on this. Um, is it okay if we do this on another time or do you have some more time because we're, we're getting close to the end of the interview? And, uh, and um, very often people have time. Um, otherwise uh, they'll say, yeah, uh, just set up another time with my secretary or uh, let's look at that or just send me a suggestion. So you can continue the, the conversation. All right, now you've done the interview and it's time to do the after work of the interview. And um, that's, uh, that's another section. So uh, you're sort of uh, putting down the, the the headset uh, and you've had a very very interesting interview and uh, now you have to do the after work and what is the after work well you've taken lots of notes and maybe your um, co-worker the person doing the interview with you also taken lots of notes and now you have to write out those notes and populate them you know you do lots of shorthand you do lots of abbreviations so on and so forth um, now you should write out the interview notes in a long and rich form. And when should you do that? You should do it right away. No coffee break, no doing something else in between, no taking a quick telephone. You actually write up the interview notes right away. And the reason is right after the interview is when you remember what they said so you type down as much as you can as fast as you can you fill out the notes as much as possible this is where they said that this is so on and so forth you do it separately if you're two people and then you merge the notes afterwards so you get because you will have noticed different things the important thing is commit as much as what's in your head to paper or silicon as 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 soon as you can okay um then you take those notes and you rewrite them into what is going to be the recording of the interview, the, the thing you go further with in the project. And that should actually be written out in a sort of grammatically correct record of a conversation, almost like a journalist is doing an interview. I, with an hour's um, interview with a person, I typically end up with three to four pages of interview notes. This is where you introduce questions in a more specific format, because often you have them just as conversations. This is where you take away stuff that's not that interesting, and you, you put that together into a coherent whole. Also, if they talk about websites, you put in a link um, and, uh, and, and so on. If you talk about a specific document or a picture or something, find it, put it in there. You know, make it into something that, that reads like a newspaper interview. Then uh, when you've done all that, you've written out the interview, you write an executive summary. Um, if you look at, you know, um, this interview is with such and such, who has the title of such and such in this company. His primary concern in this uh, topic is about uh, how to do recruiting. And he's worrying that um, not being able to find the right people for this job um, is, is, is going to be the biggest obstacle. For instance, you, you write sort of a, a little summary, one paragraph in italics, and you put that on top of the interview notes, almost like a newspaper article um, where you write kind of a little abstract of what they said. And there are a number of reasons for what you, why you do that. Um, 
first of all you're going to mail those notes back to this person so they can look at them um, and and doing that little summary forces you to think of what you got out of the interview and it, it also makes it look like a newspaper interview to them which is kind of pleasing to people who just spent an hour uh, doing it secondly if you're doing a lot of interviews if i do 20 interviews on a project and have to analyze them later it's very hard for me to remember who said what and who some person was because after about five or six interviews you start to lose track of that so um, having this shorthand form of the interview um, in on, on top uh, so you can just look at it if you have lots of um, word files for instance on a computer at least on my mac i can just look at the the, the files as i go down i can hit the space bar the first page comes up and it says it has this little summary uh, of what the interview is makes it easy to remember then uh, you make it a, into all this into a nice complete document you send it off to the interviewee straight away asking for comments that's what you do you know one hour for the interview another hour for writing it up at the end of that you send off a polite email thanking them for their time here are my notes nicely written up with the little abstract on top and you say um, if you have time take a little look at this and and see did I did I get uh, your meaning right first of all most interviewees are used to never hearing anything from researchers afterwards or perhaps being sent an article you know half a year later they're completely forgotten it sending them their interview notes first of all it, you know you're going to send it to them so it forces you to make them do them well but also it gives them a sense of achievement oh this guy was really serious about what he's doing he's actually doing a good job with this okay i'll look through it oh he's asking for more information didn't i have this analysis we did last year i can send that to him and you get lots of interesting material they will discover errors that you found and they will correct sentences where you're quoting them directly so you know that shows respect for the person at the other end and it will give you a lot of additional material and it will make you look good so next time you talk to them you get interviews very very easily it's actually worth the effort, but you have to do it right after the interview is over. Then you need to put um, all this together in a way that you can refine the interviews. I tend to use fairly simple um, you know, devices. I store them as files on my computer and so on and so forth. You need to, if you're doing things that are sort of needs to be GDPR'd, um, you need to adhere to the format um, of how you do that, perhaps by having them anonymized and then having a separate list of people's names. I'm not going to get that in, into that in too much detail, but you need to have things in a recognizable format where you can analyze it, start to do categorizations and whatever it is you do um, in order to go from having a bunch of very, very good interview data to delivering a really good research or consulting um, material. So with that, that's how you do a research interview. Uh, it is a fairly involved and exhausting process. I think it's by far the most interesting way of doing research, at least it is for me, because you learn so much and there are so many smart people out there that you can learn from every day. Thank you very much. I hope this was useful and uh, perhaps I'll interview you someday or one of you will interview me. Bye.